half in the bag. I'm filled with more gas than the Hindenburg. Yes, I know you want to watch your night court tape, Mr. Plinkett. We... Listen to me. We tried coming to your house, but it was gone. There was an expressway there. What... I don't want to go back out again. Listen, just give us the address of where you're at. Wait, let me write down the address. Mountain. Did you have a pen? Wait, that's the whole address? Mountain? Ask him which mountain. There's more than one. Which mountain? Magic Mountain? Mountain Dew? Mount Doom? Castle Grayskull? Mount Rushmore? Mount Rush Less? Look, we're going to have to call you back. You're starting to break up. Why is there an article about canine aquatics in a VCR magazine? Well, there was a craze in the 1980s where people were using VCRs as dog surfboards. Oh. <laughs> it was very short-lived, because so were most of the dogs. <laughs> People forgot to unplug the VCRs. See, that was the thing. Oh. Speaking of dogs, have you seen American Ultra? <laughs> Nima Nurazada, director of such classic films as Project X. No, not that Project X. This Project X. What the fuck? Why do you have a boner? Oh I don't. God. It's just uh, it's my underwear sitting funny. I talk shit for the same brings us a film starring Jesse Eisenberg and Kristen Stewart. No, not Adventureland. American Ultra. In this film, Eisenberg plays a stoner who is a secret CIA sleeper agent living in a podunk town in West Virginia. For no reason at all, Topher Grace, who plays a newly appointed CIA hotshot guy, wants to have him eliminated. I think deep down it's because he's secretly in love with Kristen Stewart, who is also a secret, secret agent pretending to be Eisenberg's girlfriend. Oh, spoilers. Check out the film! <laughs> uh, Susan, what did you think of American Ultra? <laughs> Uh, well, Mike, Do you have a beer on ready? Yeah, this one's almost empty. All right, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, well, Mike, I did not like American Ultra very much, but clearly that's my fault uh, because I don't like original ideas. Are you referencing Max Landis's comments? Well, I think, you know, it, it's certainly the audience's fault if a movie flops uh, and, and uh, a filmmaker should absolve themselves of any responsibility if but, their movie tanks and isn't very good. Well, we had the director of such classic films as Project <laughs> X. What a hit. Yeah. I, I, would, I would trust that man directing my script. <laughs> oh, Nima. <laughs> you did such a great job. Finding Nima? <laughs> finding Nima. Finding find, Nima's career. <laughs> we gotta find Nima a job after this. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna fight Nemo in his car with the <laughs> gas running. <laughs> We're gonna fight Nemo swinging from the rafters in his basement. Uh, what are we talking about? Oh, we're talking about Project X? <laughs> Matthew Broderick and a monkey. <laughs> I'd rather see that. There were lots of, lots of mentions of monkeys in this yeah, movie. Because some... I guess the word monkey, you can get a lot of comedic mileage out of just the word. The, well, there, it was dead silent in the theater the whole time until the, the, the redneck guy goes, hey, she fucks monkeys. It's true. And then everyone started laughing. Mm -hmm. I thought it started off, the, the setup was clunky, the middle was tedious, and it had some fun stuff towards the end. There was a, there was a brief little moment when it, when it was working, and that was the part when um, the CIA woman, um, and she comes in and she, she tries to, you know, uh, reactivate his brain. Feed, feed him the code words that reactivate yeah, yeah. The, the super soldier inside of him. Because yes. when I see Jesse Eisenberg, I think, Action star, super soldier. Very progressive, listen. Mandelbrot set is in motion. 
Echo Choir has been breached. Is that a lyric from something? Fuck. Well, the CIA operates like the mob in this movie. Mm -hmm. there, there's constant like backstabbing, and at the end of the movie, Bill Pullman is like a top FBI guy or CIA guy, and he takes. Uh, uh, I guess do we care about spoilers? It, well, I'll just say he takes somebody out into the woods uh, that disobeyed orders or went behind his back, and he just shoots him in the woods, like 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 we're watching Miller's Crossing or something. Well, okay, so that, that's the setup of the movie, basically what you said. He works in the convenience store, Connie Britton shows up, and she uh, says the code words to reactivate him so he can fight back against yeah. Topher Grace, who wants to, to eliminate him. All that would have been much better if we didn't already know everything about Jesse Eisenberg's backstory. Mm -hmm. That's what drove me nuts. Like, I'm picturing, like, I mean, I guess some stuff is given away in the trailers or whatever, but first of all, we start with a framing device. It's completely pointless where uh, any sort of threat or tension is gone because we know he survives everything because we're seeing the aftermath of it, of him being interrogated or whatever. If it was like some strange woman comes into his convenience store, she says these weird words, what's going on? And there's more of a mystery element. Instead, everything's just laid out before we even get to that scene. Yes, you, you want the story to be two steps ahead of your audience, not your audience to be two steps ahead of the story. It's sort of like a glorified stoner movie. It's like, you know, if... I wanted like a kind of more of a spunky, funnier girlfriend character mm -hmm. who, who has some charisma or yeah. charm. Um, she's also a wonderful actress. I think the only parts that really worked in this movie, and I think that's what the audience was wanting from it, was kind of, there was a lot of like, I don't want to say witty, but there was a lot of dry, kind of sarcastic humor. Mm. Um, like in terms of the contrast of a like a stoner guy be, having being a secret operative, like how he handles that, and he kind of says some funny lines. Like there's a part where he's negotiating on the phone with Topher Grace, and he's just like, "How do we do this this thing?" And it, it, he's a little clunky in it, and and I think some of the humor came from that. But it was so sporadic. How the fuck did this happen? I shot those guys in the head, and that guy, I like, I spooned him in the neck, and his shit just like. Ended. Why are people trying to stab you? I don't know. Shh. I don't know, but I am. I'm like freaking out all over the place, babe. I have like a lot of anxiety about this. Je Jesse Eisenberg works as uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and that's kind of it. Um, but he doesn't work as a stoner, and he doesn't work as a badass killing machine either. Yeah, you need someone who, with good comedic timing, who who could kind of play the like the confused. Jesse Eisenberg always just looks like. He, he looks like an Easter Island statue. <laughs> like, he, he always just is just like... Yeah. Well, I've seen interviews with him. He, he's very, very serious. He takes himself very seriously, and he, he comes across sort of pretentious. Yeah, like a, like a more of a laid-back... You don't want to do all the dumb stoner cliches, and, the, and that I kind of liked. Was that... I, I'm going to say, I thought, based on the, like, the poster for this movie and some of the trailers and stuff, I thought it was going to be more of a stoner comedy, and I'm glad it wasn't. It was just his character just happened to be a stoner, and yeah. that was kind of it. And they didn't go crazy with that. I know you hate that when they're like, ooh, pod, and yeah. then, like, the room is like That's psychedelic so colors, yeah. and you know, all those kind of... It's, it's like the laziest, easiest humor. I kept thinking of Jeff Bridges in The Big Lebowski. Like oh, the dude, sure. you know, the dude is the dude and he's laid back, but he's thrown into this like big plot and he's just sort of like, what? Yeah. You know? Can and you I mean, imagine if the dude suddenly turned into an action star in scenes like? <laughs> well, yeah, not, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like that. But um, <laughs> someone who has that kind of charisma and, and plays the role with a little bit of fun. Yeah, he always looks like he's on edge, even when he's supposed to be like stoned and just relaxing at his job and yeah. not caring about anything. So we're asked to believe this wacky premise, uh, which is somehow looks like a depressing, dark, independent film. Um, and then there are CIA scenes, which look like an Austin Powers movie. And then all of a sudden, everything becomes ultra-violent. Yes. And disturbing, which is the other part of our discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a fan of, of excessive violence in the right context. And in this movie, it, it felt uh, needlessly excessive. Yes. I'm not, I'm not a prude by any means. I love horrible graphic violence in certain things, but in this movie, it was like off-putting and weird and like, why are we doing this now? The, the first action scene that we see uh, felt like a, a direct-to-video 
action B movie. It was like <laughs> just like terribly shot. Yeah. And awkward. Well, that's what happens when you cast Jesse Eisenberg as your action star. Oh, where are we at? Uh, tone. Is that kind of what we were talking about? Tone Loke? Funky Coma Data. John Loke, he did the score for the film. Funky Cold Medina. I really like the uh, that they went with um, stock music for their action sequences. <laughs> like, rock and roll. You're listening to a demo from stockmusic.net. <laughs> <laughs> you can do like the, uh, this movie had some really awkward tonal shifts and you can do that in a way where that works mm. like i was thinking of super like yeah that, that's a movie that i think does it perfectly uh but this was just like awkward and like the pacing was awkward everything about it was just off mm -hmm. there's stuff that's really funny and there's stuff that's really scary and there's stuff that's really violent and there's stuff that's really emotional and I think all those things put together kind of make you make make you swing in so many emotional directions it's a real that's that's what that's Kristen Stewart is his uh, the character uh, undercover character was supposed to kind of like guide him back into normal life and then go back to the CIA but she, she falls in love with him and stays with him for five years and, and just, why does she fall in love with him we don't know anything about his character at the beginning of the movie uh, well he's he loves her okay I guess that's sufficient motivation. Yeah. It worked for 15 Twilight movies, so. So then, yeah, he, and he also, Topher Grace also hates um, Connie Britton. He calls her a dumb bitch, a yes. fucking bitch. Yeah. Whoa. And, and some really quality dialogue. <laughs> you cunt, <laughs> you elderly dog, you elderly cunty dog bitch. Uh, and he's angry. And I don't know why, because now he has a big job, like a big boy, and he's angry, and he hates women. So, so his character just uh, decides to on his, uh, go rogue, essentially, and go on a mission to uh, get all these goons that he's hired to kill mm -hmm. uh, Michael Sarah. No, Jesse Eisenberg. Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah, well, I think that, remember when they had them all in the truck, mm -hmm. like uh, all the secret operative guys? Um, those were all like, uh, failed or somewhat failed people of the ultra program, right? Yeah. Is that what was happening? Yeah. They weren't just like SWAT teams or something. They were like, cause they- Yeah, had... no, no, they were, yeah. They were a part of this, this mm -hmm. project. So he wanted to use all of them just to go after the one. Cause he was so angry. He was living in a town in West Virginia. And working at a gas station or working at a quick stop in the yeah. middle of the night. And yeah. He just, he just took it upon himself to eliminate all the previous ultra people that were living in undercover. Apparently he's been doing this without anyone else in the CIA noticing, I guess. Except for Bill Pullman. Well, Bill Pullman finds out. He, and he sends a secret phone call to Connie Britton. In, in but a, not to prevent it, just to tell her that it's going to happen as a courtesy? As a courtesy, yeah, for no reason. He says, you're gonna put your puppy down. So I just wanted to let you know that, but I didn't expect you to do anything about it. Yeah. So why did he even tell her? And he, as he, a courtesy. As a courtesy. He calls her and he uses the filter on, on the phone that makes him sound like Satan from the South Park movie. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if that was supposed to be funny or spooky or what, but... <laughs> and then they show Bill Pullman in the beginning, like it, watching the interrogation of Jesse Eisenberg in the pre-flashbacks. Yeah, in the, 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 the wraparound, yeah. which was completely worthless and useless. And then there's a stupid scene where he orders a drone strike to eliminate the entire town. Oh yeah, and Buster uh, Buster Bluth uh, decides at the last minute to not let it happen. And for some reason, Buster Bluth is is <laughs> is in charge of the third code. I yeah. Don't know. Why is he in charge of the third code? And Topher Grace is like yelling on the phone, like, "Do it, log shit." I thought Topher Grace was in charge of the entire operation. Why is Buster Bluth the man <laughs> with the with the? Be because Topher Grace called him. Be it's because he had to make a decision whether or not to help his best friend Connie Britton. Right. Which is brought up earlier. He drops her in like information or something. And yeah. Then, yeah. And then, 
uh, his that's his character arc is that he and then Topher Grace to... calls him and he's mad that he was helping County Britain and he says no don't do that send a drone so he sends the drone and then he changes his mind at the last minute yep he becomes a man even though they make fun of him being homosexual because he on his phone call it's his, it's his boyfriend with a picture of a dog mm -hmm. calling so I guess homosexuals don't have like a backbone. But he develops one. He so develops it's okay. one. Yeah, it's okay. yeah. There wasn't a point to him being gay. I don't know if that was just like he'll just be gay and that's yeah. his character. But it, and I don't know if him like taking a stand and not unleashing the drone had anything to do with him being gay. I think he was just supposed to be gay. Although him getting a call from it could have been his girlfriend too. It doesn't matter. Boyfriend, there girlfriend, no whatever. Yeah. There's no point to that, regardless. Yeah. What was the point? Of the movie? Was it to make you laugh? Was it to enthrall you like an action film? Well, that, that's the problem is like, it, it's not, as a comedy, it's not very funny. And as a, a, an action thriller, it's not very exciting. But it's not an action movie. Yeah. It wants to be, I think. In parts. In parts, but then in parts it wants to be like a, a, a dry, independent black comedy. And then in parts it wants to be the born identity. And it doesn't work as any of those things, really. The bud identity? The blunt oh, identity? The bored identity. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what is that shit? <laughs> this is where it's at. This is the, this is, the, it just doesn't even work anymore. <laughs> ah such comfort in design, such flawless execution. Everyone should own one of these. I agree, I agree. Oh man, come on, just give us like one of Well, let's talk about Max Landis, the writer of this film. We usually don't talk about the screenwriter. No, no. Well, this is this is partially the motivation for seeing the movie because he made uh, some tweets that have become somewhat infamous. I'm just gonna go for a minute. Yeah. I've wanted to say this. I stopped myself from tweeting it. Max Landis made some tweets where he was questioning if the reason the movie flopped is because uh, mainstream audiences don't care about original ideas anymore. So I'm left with an odd thing here, which is that American Ultra lost to a sequel, a sequel reboot, a biopic, a sequel and a reboot. Which leads me to a bit of a conundrum. Why? American Ultra had good ads, big stars, a fun idea, and honestly, it's a good movie. Isn't it? American Ultra was also beaten by the critically reviled hitman Agent 47 and Sinister, despite being a better reviewed film than either. Am I wrong? It's trying to make original movies in a big way just not a valid career path anymore for anyone but a Tarantino or a Nolan? Those hacks? The question is, has that changed? I wish I could say Ultra was a bad movie, but it isn't. Divisive, sure, but better than others this week. It seems the reviews didn't even matter, the movie didn't matter. The argument that can and will be made is big level original ideas don't money. I feel like I learned a lesson here, but I have no idea what it is. I once joked there's only so many times people will go see Thor 2. And it's, it's, it's odd timing because uh, Max Landis wrote Chronicle, which was directed by Josh Trank, who directed the Fantastic Four film. So within a month of each of those movies' releases, both of them respectively made uh, uh, controversial tweets blaming everyone but themselves for their movie's failures. Uh, they came across whiny and arrogant. So my question is, uh, did nobody care about this movie because uh, it was an original idea? Um, it's an interesting question because I read an interview with Max Landis and, and I, I didn't see his tweets, but I saw his comments about original I ideas. Hollywood shouldn't make original ideas anymore because American Ultra uh, failed. Yeah. And the only thing people want to see are remakes, sequels, reboots, etc. And it's funny because American Ultra is out. I think it has like a 40 something rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, he also tweeted negatively about Rotten Tomatoes. Now that's bad for film criticism. Then two other films came out, this, I think the same weekend as American Ultra, Sinister 2 and Hitman 47. And they made 47 of those movies? No, it's based on a video game. And I think it has like a 4% on Rotten Tomatoes, <laughs> something very low. Hitman okay. 47, and of course Sinister 2 is a sequel. So video game, 
uh, a movie and a sequel. Yeah. And so it's not, and then of course, Fantastic Four, which is a reboot based on a comic book. Yeah. So it's not a guaranteed thing either way. If right. an idea is original or a reboot or a remake, that either way it's going to be bad or unwanted. Yeah. It just depends on the quality of the material. Well, you also wonder, is he talking about mainstream, like big release movies? Because if he's talking about movies as a whole, you think of just like last year, like Boyhood, you know, which we weren't fans of, but that was a big hit critically. It did very, very well for an independent movie. You have movies like, you know, Birdman, um, uh, Nightcrawler, uh, the Whiplash, yeah, Whiplash, like all these movies, original movies done very, very well. So it makes you wonder, like, is he just talking about big mainstream movies? I don't know. And if that's the case, why would he be focused exclusively on those yeah. and not looking at movies as a whole? Yeah, he, he's, he's putting his film up there with the Avengers and, and big tentpole summer movies. And, and I think his film needs to be in the red box. <laughs> <laughs> not, you know what I mean? It's not so much the writing, it's just the idea is is kind of stale and pointless. Yeah, well some movies flop because of word of mouth, where it gets out very early that the movie sucks. This is a movie, it's got middling reviews, it's not, and it's not a terrible movie, as much as we've been making fun of it. Uh, but I think it's also marketing is a part of it, where it's like, American Ultra, what does that title mean? You know? Yeah. So you got the title where you're like, huh? You've got Jesse Eisenberg, and you're like, eh? And then you have Kristen Stewart, and you're like, nope. So that, that combination of the three just leads to nobody really interested in the movie. They should have put Buster Bluth on the poster. <laughs> Called C.I. Gay. <laughs> him, him holding like a little dog. Yeah. That would have probably done better. C.I. I would see C.I. Gay. Yeah, he, he has a little pooch in a, in a, like a, like a, a man purse. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got a gun and he's like, how do I use it? Yeah. I'm a homosexual. <laughs> How do I fire a gun? But I'm in the CIA somehow. So he would be thrown into situations where he has to fire his, his gun. And his preferred, his preferred piece is, a, is like a tiny little lady gun. And then his little like chihuahua runs up and like jumps on the bad guy's face and goes Aah! Are we sure we didn't just time travel to the 80s? What, with our CIA? W when a movie like this would actually get made? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Terminating asset how? Why are there men in hazmat suits? Thanks to your actions, two CIA assets are dead. Did you just hang up on me? Please tell me you did not just hang up on me. What would you say uh, positives were? I don't know. Connie Britton was good. I liked I liked the the uh, location of the little Quickie Mart place. I like movies set in little convenience, crappy convenience stores for some reason. Um, so I like that. The idea of having an action scene surrounding that, and then an action scene in like a what was it called? Max. Uh, Max value. Max value, like a like a, a Walmart type store. Like I think that's kind of fun. Okay. Even right. even if the execution of that scene wasn't that great, I thought the idea of it was kind of fun. It was supposed to be a single shot, but it's clearly not. It's lots of digital trickery, so it's like uh, half-assed at the, uh, the badass one-shot action scene. Half-assed badass. Half-assed badass. Uh, old hey, boy. That's a this great is title not... for a film. <laughs> Half-assed badass. That would have been a better title in American Ultra, because maybe people would have known what the fuck it's about then. Half-assed badass. <laughs> Let's roll with this. What All do right. We got? What do we got? We'll cast Jesse Eisenberg. The laziest uh, CIA agent. <laughs> Rich Evans stars as half-assed. Half-assed badass coming next winter. <laughs> The old uh, frying pan bullet trick. So, Mike, would you recommend American Ultra? Do you remember when we were leaving the theater and the guy in front of us was like, I thought it was going to be about cigarettes? The only movie you should confuse with being about cigarettes is I Love You, Philip Morris. So, what are you asking me again? <laughs> would you recommend this film? Um, no. Okay. I won't either. <laughs> <laughs> Misca horribly miscast. Mm -hmm. Very, two varying of tones. Um, it's not funny enough, yeah. and it's ultra violent and ultimately pointless, and the plot is not interesting or revealing. Yeah. You, you're, you're three steps ahead of the movie, you want it to be over, 
and then you have to watch sickening violence, and then you have to watch Kristen Stewart try to act. Yeah, and that's that's more sickening than the violence. We'll take my car and we'll go get stoned. You want to get out right now? Okay, no, no, no. I recognize that now as like a faux pas. Hey, mom, mom, mom. Oh my goodness, the phone is ringing. Oh my god. Lightning fast VCR repair. Uh, yes, we do screenplay consulting. Uh, let me just get your name down. Uh, the Max Landis, is it L-A-N-D-I-S? Yeah, we'll take a look at it and give you some thoughts. Yeah. Hey, I, I saw you in that, uh, that film about the, the marine dog. I, I thought it was excellent, and I thought you did a really good job. Especially your, your delivery on the line, woof, 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 was especially perfect. <laughs> yes, I didn't know you wrote scripts. Yeah, what, do you have a special device that translates your barks in, into dialogue, or do you use, do, you, do your paws mash down on the keyboard? Okay, Max. All right, we'll talk later. Bye.